Jeremy Hunt, welcome to Acting Prime Minister and thanks so much for being our first guest of this new series. It's a pleasure. Nice to see you, Paul. How was your recess? Did you get away anywhere? Uh, I did get away to Italy for 10 days, which was absolutely fantastic. And I took my son to Paris for the weekend uh, before the quarantine measures were introduced. uh, And we had a fantastic time. So um, I had a pretty good time. But I have to say, after nearly five months of my uh, gorgeous kids, um, there was just a small corner of my heart that was quite relieved to come back this week. Enough homeschooling, enough juggling, childcare. Yeah, I think, I think you've captured the mood of a nation there, to be honest. Um, now, the purpose of this podcast is to envisage what you would love to do if you were Prime Minister. Of course, you spent quite a lot of time envisaging that because you did run to be leader of the Conservative Party. So you've kind of been through this process a little bit before. And I just wonder whether you feel like you, you have had a bit of a lucky escape, because this has got to be one of the, the most difficult times in history to be Prime Minister, hasn't it? Well, you don't put yourself forward for that job unless you really want to do it. And I think most people who do put themselves forward have a sense that uh, great prime ministers are very often made as much in adversity as in the good times. And uh, lots of prime ministers have their plan for the country. Uh, Some manage to implement it, most don't. Um, And most actually end up being defined by events over which they have no control at all. I certainly agree that coping with a pandemic is a a huge ask for any prime minister. And uh, not just because of what the nation's looking for in a moment like this, but also because all your plans as prime minister tend to cost money and the effect of coronavirus is to shoot the nation's finances to pieces. Um, And uh, I look back at some of the things I wanted to do this time last year, for example, increased defence spending to 3% of GDP. Um, I'd still love to do that. But those kind of commitments become much harder to honour. And, and you're right that crises like this do, do sort of shape a prime minister and, and define a legacy for a prime minister. And actually, when you look at Boris Johnson, it's astonishing how much has changed even since December in terms of his popularity ratings. What's your sense of, of how this will, will shape him as a prime minister? Well, I think it will shape him enormously, Um, not least because, you know, he came pretty close to dying as a result of coronavirus. And so I think, you know, he's been on the steepest possible learning curve. He's had a lot of stick. He's had uh, to take very difficult decisions. He's had to explain very difficult trade-offs. And he's probably had, you know, what took... Theresa May, two years of uh, hard grafting to discover how tough that job can be. He's he's had it in just a few months. So um, I'm absolutely sure it has shaped him. Okay, well, let's get on to you being Prime Minister now. And uh, we always like to get people settled into Downing Street. So you walk through that Downing Street door and you can take any personal item that you like from home. What What is something that you couldn't do without, do you think, if you were Prime Minister? Um, I couldn't do without my iPhone. And um, I I happen to know, because of the way that office works, that um, it is strongly discouraged to have your own iPhone instead of the official one, because basically uh, it's so much easier for people outside to hack into. So um, uh, my, I just, like most people these days, I I live on my iPhone. You get uh, told off by your family for being on your phone too much then. Um, I basically have a rule. I try not to have it in the bedroom with me. Um, but that is very difficult when you're uh, foreign secretary or prime minister because you can be woken up in the middle of the night because things happen on the other side of the world and so on. Um, but uh, yes, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm a compulsive iPhone user, I'm afraid, uh, for absolutely everything. And what's the first drink that you'd pour yourself, do you think, of you, as you're sort of settling into that, that, that uh, red box at the Downing Street desk? Well, I think um, my tipple of choice is Asahi beer. So I would probably reach for a bottle of Asahi beer um, just at that very, uh, that, that moment of triumph, which, uh, of course, uh, I never got that close to, but, but perhaps closer than some. And who would be your first phone call? Who would you call first? 
Well, I'm assuming that uh, I'll be with my wife um, and uh, kids. Um, so I think the first person I call would have to be my mum. And uh, uh, that would be a, a bittersweet moment because uh, my dad died six years ago and uh, he followed my political career very closely. He was a, an officer in the Royal Navy. Um, and in fact, um, by complete coincidence, um, in, in 2012, uh, when I was, uh, I think I'd, I'd just become health secretary and um, I'd been through the Leveson issue, which, uh, you know, in the end, I was completely clear, but it was a pretty tough period for me politically. And I had a sense of the impermanence of politics. And I said to uh, David Cameron, uh, would he mind if I took my parents on a quick tour of Downing Street? And he said, of course. And uh, so I took them on a tour of Downing Street. I showed them where I sat around the cabinet table. And uh, a year later, my dad died. So I was just so pleased that uh, I had the chance to do that. Absolutely. So he, 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 he lived to see you in the cabinet, which is a pretty astonishing achievement. So I'm sure he was um, very proud of all of, your, all of your political achievements. And let's talk a little bit about your path to power now, about your, your background. So you studied PP at Oxford, and then you went on to be an English language teacher in Japan. Um, then you became an entrepreneur, including a failed attempt to export marmalade to Japan, which you've talked about before, and a very successful venture setting up the educational listings company Hot Courses, which made you a fair few million, if you don't mind me saying. Um, you were elected in 2005 as MP for South West Surrey, and since then you've gone on to be, as I said, culture secretary, health secretary, and and, um, foreign secretary. A lot of that is well known about you. What I hadn't realised is that you're also a distant cousin of the Queen. Is that is that true or is that an internet myth? I think, um, do you know, I, I read about this on the internet. I'd never heard about it <laughs> myself. And, um, and I think uh, there is one of those internet hereditary sites that can can go back several hundred years and find some kind of uh, a link, but probably no more of a link than you actually, and, and millions of other people when you go back that far. But um, so um, I, I must admit, it's not something I'd ever uh, known, and I'm not entirely sure whether it's true or not. <laughs> yeah, apparently it's a, it's a fifth cousin, so that means you share great, 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 great grandparents, which, as you say, we probably all do, don't we? I'm sure the Queen is is very honoured. <laughs> Well, look, if the Queen did appoint her fifth uh, cousin to be Prime Minister, you would have some very pressing matters on, on the desk, of course, not least of all this, this pandemic. And as we go into the autumn and winter, of course, the, the big concern is about whether we'll see an increase in cases, potentially a second wave of the virus. What is the one thing as Prime Minister that you would want to do to, to limit the risk of a second wave? Well, I would want to do something that uh, Boris Johnson has already started to do, but I want to go a lot further. Um, I would really want to expand the testing program so that we could almost get to a point where we're testing the whole population every week. Um, but, um, you know, that is a, a very big ask. Um, as an intermediate step, I'd want to have expanded it by now so that we were at least testing all NHS staff and all teachers every week so that people could be absolutely confident when they were using hospitals, uh, when they were sending their kids to school, that they were coronavirus-free zones. Um, and I think this mass testing, um, which could potentially be linked to an app on your phone so that you could show people on your phone the last time you got tested, ultimately that is the way that we can completely uh, crack this virus uh, in that period before we have a vaccine. In fact, if you had population testing, there's there's no reason why you, uh, theoretically, you would need to have social distancing. You could pretty much carry on life as normal because you just know that everyone you are mixing with have been tested very, very recently. So that's probably the biggest single change. Although presumably you'd have to test, you know, about something like 60 million people a, a week. I mean, maybe you'd exclude very young children, but that's pretty tough to do, isn't it? I mean, the testing capacity would have to be astronomical. It would be. But, um, you know, we've shown in this country that we can move mountains in emergencies. And in fact, you know, even getting up to 100,000 tests a day uh, was considered an impossible ask when Matt Hancock announced that at the beginning of April. And we're now on 350,000 tests a day. Um, but 
Um, the truth is you don't have to actually get to saturation population coverage. I mean, if, for example, you're, you're testing every teacher in every school every week, you will pick up outbreaks or growth in the uh, transmission of the virus very, very quickly. It becomes like your early warning radar system. Uh, so uh, that's why I think that's, that's the direction we have to go because, you know, we shouldn't take for granted that we will get a vaccine. I believe we will. I think it's likely that by around Easter, uh, most of us will have had it, but we can't be sure. And, uh, you know, we still don't have a cure for AIDS and we've been, we've been trying that for a very, very long time. Um, so that's why I think uh, we should go down that route. And as you say, I mean, the beauty of that solution is it does liberate people to then go back to work. There's no self-isolating, or at least not to the same degree. And that, of course, is the other thing that Boris Johnson's having to balance as Prime Minister is the needs of the economy at the moment. And there's quite a lot of pressure on people to go back to work. Do you think that people should feel sort of a sense of duty to get back to the office? Well, I think um, there are different things happening at the moment. I mean, I, I do think we, we need to get everyone back to work because um, you know, our city centre businesses are really suffering at the moment. And, you know, you, you go around Westminster in the morning and it's, as you'll know, it's just a tiny fraction of the, the people and cars and bicycles that you, you normally have. Um, but also... Um, I think what we'll find is a permanent change where people have found that it's much easier to do home working uh, than they thought. And that will lead to a big increase in the number of people working two, three, four days a week in the office and, and a day a week at home. And I think that's a good thing. It'll lead to a big improvement in quality of life, more family time and so on. But I think we'll also find that uh, successful businesses need a creative buzz. And you get that from interacting with people. So you're clearly working from home today and you can carry on doing much of what you might have done before from home. But I think it's difficult to embark on new projects when you're working from home because for that you you need that buzz of being around people, yeah. allowing ideas to spark off each other. I always imagine what it must be like to start a new job, for example, during you know yes. lockdown or even this period after lockdown it must be very difficult to know what you're supposed to do or ask for any help or create ideas as you say yes and I, and I think back to my old life as an entrepreneur and you know what what you could I, you could carry on your existing business on zoom and microsoft teams but I think sales is really hard I mean sales is when you want to meet someone and persuade them to buy your product and uh it's really hard to do that if you're not face to face. So I think we do need to get back. Um, but I don't think we should do it by taking any risks. I'm not one of these people who says we should start taking silly risks. The, the biggest threat to business confidence in the next six months will be if we start seeing increased transmission of the virus. That's, that's the thing we've got to avoid. I mean, the other threat the businesses are worried about are these rumours that there may be tax rises in the budget uh, in the autumn, which we're expecting from the Chancellor. How do you feel personally as a as a fairly liberal conservative? You know, do you do you worry that maybe the Chancellor is going to impose tax rises? Well, I think um, there are going to be very difficult choices. Um, I mean, there is no country in the world that has become a prosperous, world-beating economy by spending money that it doesn't earn. And so, the idea that you can just uh, you can grow off the back of um, endlessly growing debt uh, just just doesn't work and the countries that have tried it uh, have generally failed. Um, but I'd be surprised if the tax rises that come in uh, come in quite as soon as this autumn because I think this is such a fragile time for confidence that um, I suspect we might wait a little bit but with a few signals from the Chancellor that uh, tax rises are going to have to come. And I think we have to be honest that um, two things, really. First of all, um, whilst the economy is still behind the productivity levels that we had in January of this year, uh, there's going to be a gap in tax revenues that has to be filled somehow. Um, and, you know, secondly, there are enormous pressures on 
the budget. Um, the social care system happens to be one that I'm focusing on in the select committee at the moment. Um, and we, if we want to be a society that treats older people with dignity and respect, which I think all British people do, uh, then we are going to have to put more money into the social care system. So uh, I think in the long run, even if we hadn't had coronavirus, uh, we were looking to certain areas where we were going to have to spend more money. So you're saying essentially that, that maybe tax rises are inevitable and that the government's just got to be honest about that? I think they are inevitable. I think we do have to be honest. I think we will try very hard to make sure that um, wealthier people bear the brunt of those tax rises. Um, but um, I think we have to be honest, we may not be able to just put the pain on the, the very highest earning because the revenue base may just may not be big enough. Um, you know, social care, the NHS, uh, defence, all these areas are areas that are going to need more investment. OK, well, look, as chair of the Select Committee, the Health and Social Care Select Committee, um, you said that you want to rate um, the government's policies on health, a bit like the CQC, the Care Quality Commission, does when it rates hospitals and, and care homes. What, would your, what do you think your current rating would be for the way the government has, has handled the pandemic? I mean, presumably not outstanding. Um, I think it's... Um... You know, first of all, I should say, um, Paul, that it's a very um, complex thing giving a rating when you have a select committee that is made up of 11 partisan MPs. We're all members of political <laughs> parties. The Labour MPs would give them a fail, right? And, the, and um, some of the very logical MPs would give so them a fail. So the right way that we've done it is we've actually appointed someone completely independent, Professor Jane Dacre, who's a former president of the Royal College of Physicians, who's putting together an expert panel to come up with an assessment uh, that we will accept or reject, but a recommendation. So I, I don't want to um, give them an overall ranking, I'm very sorry to say, but <laughs> what I will say is that I do think they are learning very fast. And I will just give you an example of that. You know, six months ago, we didn't quarantine people coming here, even from North Italy or Iran or mm. China countries that were very, very high risk. Um, we didn't have a test and trace process. Our kids were out of school. Um, and we have come a very, very long way. And we're having localised lockdowns. Uh, test and trace is, is, is getting better and better. And I think that, you know, if you look at the countries that were most effective at fighting the virus, the, the Koreas, uh, places like Taiwan, um, Germany, Finland, uh, we are now implementing all the things that they did, um, and that's got to be the right thing. There have been quite a lot of sort of unforced U-turns from the government too, though, whether it was on, you know, the over the exams fiasco or face masks in schools. A lot of backbenchers that I speak to are quite frustrated about that. They feel as though these were these were U-turns that didn't really need to be made, that maybe the government should have just had a different policy to begin with. What do you make of the of the number of U-turns the government has has performed? Well, it's obviously uh, too high and uh, it's, you know, it's something that uh, they need to sort out. Um, but I think we've got a combination of two things that have led to this. Um, one of them is a new government with a new prime minister and a largely new cabinet. Um, and that means that many cabinet ministers are, you know, just reading themselves into their briefs. Um, and um, the second thing is a pandemic, which means that uh, scientific advice changes. Um, there is a degree of risk. Uh, judgments change much more quickly than in normal times. So I think rather than looking at uh, individual decisions, and of course it's unfortunate when you have to change any individual decision, I think the important thing is to look at the, the broad direction of travel. And you know, as one of the people who criticised the government very publicly for not locking down earlier, for not doing test and trace, uh, for not doing local lockdowns. I feel a lot more comfortable as we go into winter, which is which is a very high risk period, that the, the building blocks for a successful coronavirus strategy are in place, um, which means I think we can be hopeful that we won't have to have another national lockdown. And part of that, of course, is local lockdowns. They are going to be key to, to all of this. And today there's been a, another bit of confusion because Trafford and Bolton have been told that they will um, remain within the new restrictions that were imposed in the Northwest uh, in July. 
There does seem to be a, a bit of a communication problem with some of these local lockdowns. Do you think the communication could be clearer? Because they, they do seem to be sort of fairly last minute and and a bit up and down, really. Yes, I mean, I look, I, I understand that uh, there is, you know, there are there's party politics, um, people from different parties having to work together in this situation, and that's not always easy. But I do think it's really important if there are differences of opinion uh, that you know those debates happen behind closed doors and then a decision is announced and everyone sticks to it because I think the trouble with um, you know one person in a position of responsibility saying we should do x and someone else saying we should do y is that that undermines public trust and so just in these very very exceptional times I think it's really important that all those who are making these decisions work together and, and and try and hold a common line. Yeah, because you're, what you're alluding to there is some of the councils weren't particularly happy with the idea that Trafford and Bolton would be would be taken out of restrictions. They were concerned about arising cases. I just wonder whether the government the government's own communication could be a bit clearer as well, though, because a lot of these decisions seem to be made quite last minute, don't they? Yes, but, you know, as someone who criticised the government quite publicly for taking too long to make decisions. What we're now seeing is uh, them taking decisions incredibly quickly, sometimes too quickly, but I, I'm not going to turn around and criticise them for doing that because I, I, I'm, I'm one of the people who thinks that in a pandemic you err on the side of caution. Difficult though it is, you know, if, if you're in doubt, uh, apply the precautionary principle. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a good example, face masks. Um, you know, they, there's huge debate about the efficacy of face masks. But um, the truth is that we aren't in a position to have randomized control trials to give us the definitive answer. And we just have to use a bit of common sense. And if this is a disease that can be transmitted through droplets in the air, then you're obviously protecting your neighbors from your own coughing and spluttering if you're wearing a face mask. So, so I think we took too long over that decision. And I think we've just got to, uh, you know, be a bit bolder and use common sense to come to some of these decisions more quickly. Okay, and look, throughout the pandemic, I've been focused on on social care at ITV News mostly. And so I want to ask you a bit about that as well, because I know it's something you care a lot about too. And when you were Health Secretary, you actually incorporated social care into the title of your department, which I find really interesting because throughout my reporting, what I discovered was that social care very much felt like an afterthought, that they did feel as though social care, you know, carers felt as though social care came second to the to the health service. Do you think it's sort of fair for them to feel like that? Do you, do you think that's the case, that, that social care and care homes do always come second to, to the NHS and hospitals? Well, we've absolutely got to stop that happening. Um, it it's doesn't get solved at the stroke of a pen by incorporating the words social care into the Secretary of State's title. Um, because there's always a gravitational pull from the NHS caused by the fact that the, the health secretary actually owns and runs hospitals for all of us in a way that he or she doesn't own or run care homes or social care providers which are contracted to the independent sector. So you have a series of operational decisions affecting hospitals that you don't have with the social care system. Um, but it needs to be treated exactly equally. And um, that is because um, we have growing numbers of older, very vulnerable people who are hopping in and out of hospital. And they are users of the social care system and the NHS. And the only logical way uh, to keep them healthy and well is to have a single integrated approach to their care. Now it's starting to happen, it's much better than it ever was, but um, there's probably a lot of plumbing that needs to be put in place. We need to have electronic care records that are shared by doctors and care homes so that everyone can see someone's care plan and, and everyone's working off the same uh, hymn sheet. But you're right, I think the pandemic has exposed the fact that the social care system is still the poor relation. And there is one big, big moment that we can take a step towards putting that right. And that is when we do the spending review, which is due to be before the end of this year, when we must give the social care system a 10-year plan 
just like we gave the NHS a 10-year plan. It was the last big thing I did as health secretary. I wanted to do it for the social care system at the same time. The Treasury said it'll have to wait till the spending review. Well, now is the spending review. Um, three years later, sadly, I know, two years later, gosh, time flies very, very quickly. Um, but we've got to sort this out. Very important. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the question that follows on from that and has plagued many governments is how do you actually fund an increase in spending for social care? You know, do we review the funding model for social care? Maybe there's, you know, maybe we need to increase taxes on the over 40s, for example. If you were prime minister, having looked at it as health secretary, what do you think the answer is for funding funding social care? Well, I'm not particularly bothered about how you pay for it, but I think you have to be honest that you are going to have to pay for it through um, increased contributions or increased taxes. Um, I think uh, an increase in the national insurance rate for people over the age of 40 is a perfectly reasonable approach because people's salaries tend to be getting higher uh, when they're in their, their 40s and 50s um, and they tend to be thinking about their own old age. Um, it's never popular to float these tax rises, but I notice in, in Japan, since they did that, mm. uh, there has been no political kickback from uh, the public. They, they accept that. I also noticed that since George Osborne introduced the social care precept on our council taxes, there's been no political pushback. People haven't been saying this needs to be scrapped, this is outrageous. Um, and council tax is one of the most sensitive taxes and one of the most unpopular taxes. So I think if the public know what it's for uh, and they understand that that's what it's being used for, uh, they will generally be uh, receptive to the idea because I think everyone has older relatives in their family and everyone wants to know everyone wants to know that they're going to be looked after properly. Yeah, it's a reality that's coming for us all and it's and it's not, you know, in my experience having reported on it, it's not it's not sustainable the way it is. And just quickly on that, do you think carers should should get a pay rise? Because it is astonishing how low how low the pay is in the care sector for some people who are doing, you know, a brilliant job. Yes. Um, look, I think everyone in the um, NHS and social care sector deserves a huge pay rise after what they've been through over the last uh, six months. Um, I think what the government is planning is, is the right thing in this, which is increasing the national living wage, because most people working in the social care sector are paid by private companies. Um, so those wages aren't controlled by the government. But you have to be honest that if you're going to increase the national living wage, uh, then that's going to put up the costs for care homes, and that's then going to put up the cost for councils who pay for uh, around half the residents of care homes. So that ultimately is going to mean more funding from the government for the social care sector. Okay, well, look, we're running out of time here. So let's finish the podcast the way we always do with a few quick fire questions. So if you were Prime Minister, who would you rather do business with, President Trump or President Biden? Ah, oh, um, I'm going to be a, a, a diplomat here, as that was my profession. As a uh, we, have to, we have to do business with whoever the United States president <laughs> is. In this case, both have their pluses and minuses, but they're, uh, they're a pretty stark choice. Said like a former foreign secretary. Um, where would you be pictured on holiday? I mean, you've just said that, you, that you've been to Italy and you've been to Paris. Where would your sort of holiday destination be as prime minister, do you think? Well, as Prime Minister, I would do exactly what Boris Johnson has done and take my holidays in Scotland, because this is a time to think about the union. Um, but I'm not saying I wouldn't also go to other places as well, but I definitely want to. Uh, I, I lived in Scotland for two years. Uh, I love it. It's a fantastic place. Um, but that's the, the proper place right now for uh, Prime Ministers to be enjoying themselves. And uh, the Prime Minister took his dog, uh, Dylan, up there. What, which, um, which pet would you take into Downing Street, do you think? Have you got a, an animal? I don't have a pet at the moment. Um, and uh, now I'm not a government minister. I'm under huge pressure to get one. And uh, <laughs> we've always grown up with uh, Labradors in my family. So I guess it would be a Labrador. Very, very sorry for you, but I am a sorry MP. <laughs> and lastly, would you ever run again to be Prime Minister, do you think? I don't rule it out. Um, you know, the ambition in me uh, is less than it was, but it, it certainly hasn't uh, 
died away. Um, but uh, but not right now. Um, I think uh, right now is a time when I'm thoroughly enjoying being on the back benches, having a bit more time for my uh, my kids, hopefully being a slightly better husband than I was uh, for nine years in office. So um, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. Okay, well, it's nice to have a happy first guest on our podcast uh, for this series. Jeremy Hunt, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure to have you. Likewise, Paul. Thanks a lot.